Hi, I'm Roger Sadowski from Sadowski Guitars. I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you my approach to setting up a bass. I've always felt that bass players should be able to do basic maintenance on their own instruments. It's not rocket science. And so I'm going to go over with you the basic tools and the basic order in which to approach things with the goal of you being able to maintain your basses for routine maintenance. The very first thing to do is to tune the bass. But before we do that, there's one step that everybody overlooks, including myself many times, and it should be the first thing I think you should do. And that is, if you have a bolt-on instrument, to tighten these neck bolts. They do come loose over time, and it's very important for both stability and sound that they be tight. Now, whenever you're screwing on an instrument, I like to put my fingers around the head. In case I slip, I won't damage the finish. So you want to tighten your neck bolts like this. Do them, get them nice and snug. And then you want to tighten your strap buttons because these tend to come loose. So you tighten this one, and then you tighten this one. Okay. Now we're ready to tune. And again, I'm using a Peterson clip-on stroke tuner, but you can use whatever tuners you have. For regular tuning, any tuner is fine. I'm just fussy about a stroke tuner for adjusting intonation. So just to tune now. And what's important is that the instrument be at pitch when you're going to adjust the truss rod. Now, a lot of you, I know from experience, are terrified of adjusting truss rods. And so I want you to relax. Uh, it's very difficult to break a truss rod. And the hardest thing to learn is when you know that your neck is properly adjusted. All truss rods work in the same direction in the sense that if you have too much bow in your neck this way, you want to tighten the truss rod, which means turning in this direction, clockwise. And if uh, your neck is back bowed and you want to loosen the rod, you want to go the other direction, and that's counterclockwise. One of the ways you know that you need to adjust your truss rod is, again, one of two things. Either you'll get buzzing just in the first position and not further up in the neck. That would indicate the neck is back bowed a bit. The other thing would be one of two ways. If your intonation is really off in the first position, that may mean that there's too much relief and that it's actually raising the height of the strings above the first fret too much. The other would be when you have too much curve in the neck, you essentially develop a high spot here relative to here. So if you start getting buzzing right in this range here, that might indicate also that there's too much curve in the neck. The neck moves as a function primarily of humidity changes. Uh, it's less about temperature and more about humidity. So for example, in temperate climates, uh, when the heat goes on in the, uh, at, towards the end of the year, December, and things get dry in your apartment, the neck has a tendency to move one way or the other. And likewise, when the heat and humidity of the summer occurs, the neck also may have a tendency to move. So it's totally normal to have to adjust your neck at least twice a year as a result of seasonal changes. My experience is, with the exception of going to the point where a neck is back bowed, I have the best success with the neck essentially dead flat. And what you can do is use the outer string as your straight edge. So if I hold the string down at the first fret and then hold it down at the 12th fret, I am actually using the string as a straight edge. And where I want to focus my attention on is right about uh, the seventh fret. And by lightly tapping the string right here, you can tell if there's a gap or if there's no gap. And you can actually manipulate your light so you can see if there's a space there. Now, if you're too tight on the neck, the neck is going to backbow. 
and that's going to cause buzzing in the very first position. So if you, after you've adjusted it and you are getting buzzing on the first, second, or third fret, that is a sign that you might have over-tightened the rod and you just want to loosen it up a little bit. Just to the point where this clears up the buzzing here and then recheck it here. Again, it's okay to have a touch of light around the seventh fret, but you really don't need a big gap there at all. If you can slip a, a thick business card in this space, uh, you probably have a little too much relief. And, but that would be the absolute maximum you should have if you have a heart attack. Okay, now we're going to uh, adjust our action at the bridge. And the tools we need for that are either one of these action gauges or a six inch ruler and I'm going to be talking in inches. Uh, I'm not uh, that fluid with metric system, but we will post things where you can convert or see the metric equivalents to what I'm discussing. So whenever I measure action, I'm always holding the string I'm measuring at the first fret. And that's to eliminate the height of the nut as affecting the height of the string right here, okay? And then I'm measuring always at the 12th fret. And where you're measuring is from the bottom of the string to the top of the fret. I'm going to start with my lowest action setup. And this is the action that players who have a fairly light right hand touch uh, would be able to play well with. And uh, then we'll discuss progressively higher actions. So I'm going to start here at 2 30 seconds of an inch. And let me just grab my cheat sheet so I can tell you that in metric, that is about 1.6 millimeters here at the 12th fret. Okay. And so what you need is your appropriate wrench. And most, most base bridges have a separate height adjustment for each saddle. There are some bases that are more like a true pneumatic style where there's just one adjustment for the base side, one adjustment for the treble side, and they have a fixed curve. But most bridges allow you to adjust each string individually, not only for the height, but also to maintain a curvature here that matches the curvature of the fingerboard. So I'm going to set the first string at 230 seconds. And you merely do it by raising or lowering these screws, these little Allen screws in the bridge. And you always want to try to keep the bottom of the saddle parallel to the base of the bridge. You don't want a sharp angle where one half of the saddle is sticking up in the air and the other is really low. You want them kind of even on both sides of the saddle. Let me back up for a second. If we're going to say this is 230 seconds, then the comparable uh, height on the base side is going to be 330 seconds. And what we want to do, and it gets a little hard to measure, but you can see it visually, we want the D string to be just a little bit higher than the G. We want the A string to be just a little bit higher than the D. And we want the uh, E string to be just a little higher than the A. And the B string just a little higher uh, than the E. And so, again, I'll get my high string at 2.30 seconds, then I'll get my bass string at 3.30 seconds, and then again, going to follow the curve of the board, just a little bit higher on the second string, a little bit higher than that on the third, on the fourth, and on the fifth. And uh, this may take some practice, just so you can see the graduations on these gauges, but uh, basically we're going from two to three, 30 seconds. The highest I've ever had to set up an action for anybody is three to four, 30 seconds. And back in the days, and I'm talking in the early 80s, uh, when I was dealing with all the New York studio players, I was kind of shocked at how high everybody's action was. And that was because they had to play so cleanly in the studio. And the quality of their instruments back in that day, a lot of them needed the fingerboard to retrude, a lot of them had bad fretwork. 
And so they would raise the action to whatever point they needed to play clearly. But as uh, instruments have gotten better, as I've done a thousand fingerboard retrues and refrets over the last 40 years, uh, I've been able to nudge the actions progressively lower. The only players I have found who can go lower than two to three have been some of the Latin players who play with a very, very light right hand touch. And some of the funk players, uh, they're able to go on a little bit lower but players who need to articulate and play cleanly, I would say two to three at the lowest. And, and you're going to laugh at me, but instead of saying 364, I'm going to say two and a half, 30 seconds. Um, and um, so you want to go that much higher. And the highest you would go would be three to four. So we're concerned now with intonation. So. You need a tuner. Again, in the, uh, previously mentioned, I really like stroke tuners. So on the headstock here, I've got the Peterson stroke, the headstock stroke. And over here, for the sake of the camera, uh, we have our larger Peterson stroke. Um, and I want you to understand that you can approximate intonation with a kind of needle type or LED type tuner but nothing is as accurate as a stroke tuner, and I think it's a great investment. Also, Peterson has an app, a stroke tuner app, you can get for like $10 for your phone, and that's absolutely perfect. All right, so the first thing we need to do is a reference note, we, the note that we tune to. So you have a choice of the open string or the 12th fret harmonic. So whichever gives you the clearest reading on your tuner, is the one you can use. And then you're going to compare that reference note to the fretted note at the 12th fret. Now to ensure accuracy, you want to hold the instrument as if you're playing it. If you do it like this, it's not going to be accurate. So hold the instrument like you're playing it, tune your reference note. So right now I'm going to tune the G. little bit flat. Okay, and then you want to play the 12th fret, the octave note, with a normal amount of playing pressure, like you would do if you were actually playing the instrument. Trying to look at both tuners. I'm seeing this drift a little bit flat. So what I want to do, if your 12th fret note is flat relative to your reference note, you want to bring the saddle front closer to the neck. If your fretted note is sharp compared to your reference note, you want to pull the saddle back away from the neck. Almost all bridges just use a regular screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver. So I'm going to Loosen this, move it front, and you always want to push the screw front like this because it, it tends to develop some slack, okay? So now I'm going to retune my reference note. And then play the octave. And I'm still drifting just a little bit flat. I'm basically there, but it's just drifting a little bit flat. Go a little further up. Retune the reference note. And that's, that's nailed. That's as good as you're gonna get, okay? So you wanna do that for every note, every string, uh, tuned to the octave or the open string, and compare to the fretted string at the 12th fret. So that's the basics on how you intonate your instrument. Once you're done with this, you're all set. Go ahead and make some music.